Yes. <laughs> so I'll be walking out for some very specific <laughs> intro music that was picked for me by my good friend, Adam Rowe. We challenged each other to pick each other's walk-on music for the tour. I put mine on the fairway. I was a little scared of poking the bear. I picked for his tour, great tour, 79 dates, absolutely hoofed it. I picked Right Said Fred, I'm Too Sexy. I thought that'll make him look a bit of a dick. He wasn't asked. He loved it. He actually said to me, it's quite good walk on music. Also, he's so fucking confident, he's like, lad, I am too sexy. So he's just, <laughs> he just owned it the whole tour. He picked for me the national anthem of Great Britain, <laughs> which has been so fucking problematic. It's genius. I mean, it's evil genius, but it's genius. I started the tour in Belfast. <laughs> he tried to get me killed. Next night was Dublin, they fucking hated it. And this is where evil genius really flourishes. That week, she fucking died. <laughs> it's been great watching crowds react to it. Uh, the booing in Liverpool, everyone's booed it. Glasgow, fuck it, they really booed it. In Belfast, some of them booed it, some of them loved it, like fucking it. <laughs> Got a little bit eggy. The worst though, I kind of like the booze, the worst is when people sing it. It's definitely the worst. In Leeds, they all sang it. It was a really awkwardly white crowd that night as well. And my support at that night was Ishan Akbar. And one of the more cringier moments of my career, bringing out a half Bengali, half Pakistani support act to a lot of white Yorkshire people singing the national anthem. Ishan's face like, why haven't we been booked for a BNP meeting? What? Don't start singing it. Easy, easy. Fucking hell. Good effort there, good effort. It wasn't the most booing ever. Some of the socialists got right in there. Last week in Liverpool, went, someone went, fuck the Tories! And that was, that was a nice moment. Didn't expect that in Chester. <laughs> but you did all right with it. I love it when people, some people boo it, and then some people go, no, 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 no. It's fair enough, you you do what you want to do. People asked me if I was worried about um, Ireland, about the whole, like, national anthem intro thing, and I wasn't. I knew it would all be podcast fans. It was all going to be people that come see me. I knew it would be sound. I was a little worried about Ireland because of the topless traveller call-out video character that I've been doing <laughs> quite a lot online for the last year. I love it, by the way. There's a, I love topless traveller call-out videos. I don't know how you use the internet, but if I see one of them, I'm watching the whole thing. I just find it so raw and visceral. A dude with his top off in a car park, surrounded by his cousins, just staring down a camera phone going, do you want a little bit of this? It's fucking exciting. Did it on the pod, everyone thought it was funny. And then last year, we were going for Christmas number one on the podcast. We got Christmas number 139. <laughs> we done fucked up. <laughs> but we were doing a call out. We were doing a call out to our competition, Elton John and Adele. Not Lad Baby, that horrible rat. We were doing it. We were ignoring that cunt. We were, we were having a go at Adele. I quite like Adele. But in the moment, we were staring down the camera. All of a sudden, my top's off, and I'm going, Do you want a little bit of this, Adele? Do you want to fucking have you? You ginger bollocks. I was, I, my top should never be off, by the way. My, my top should never be off on YouTube. Mate, I'm 41, and I'm a YouTuber. That sounds proper paedophilic anyway, doesn't it? <laughs> Don't take your top off, Dan. My little mantis jiggling in the wind. You want a little bit of this, Adele? 
Everyone was laughing, so I did it at a live show. Everyone fucking roared. It was a great reaction. Did it again and again, kept doing it at live shows. And it's all been fun, isn't it? Until you're in Ireland and they think you've been taking the piss. Because <laughs> you kind of were. Now, I know we mess around and do characters. I love doing all of that stuff. and I don't want to upset anyone's community, particularly not theirs, because they're scary. And I get it's a, a contentious one with the traveller community. Some people are very touchy about it. Other people don't give a shit. It's a weird one. And uh, I'm not underestimating the fact that they do suffer a lot of prejudice. I know that's uh, a real thing because I felt it in me. I felt the prejudice. And that's not something I'm particularly proud to say. I, uh, I bought a house three years ago. Me and Laura, my wife, bought a house three years ago. It's our forever home. I don't know if you've heard that term. Um, usually people mean it's like, oh my God, we love it so much. We just never want to leave. I'm not that arsed about the house. And where we live is fine. I just fucking ain't moving. So I'm staying till I die. That's how that's going to go down. We bought the house of a uh, grubby old dude. Now, it's not a professional term you hear in property, but he was a bit of a grubby fucker. Not like, I'm like, dirty, rather than like, dirty. <laughs> like, out the window, like, I'll give you a viewing. Like... It was just a bit messy. I can't tell the full story of how untidy it was in the house, but this tells the full tale. All you need to know, he hadn't flushed the toilets for the viewing. <laughs> oh, that's nasty. And someone actually said to me, how did you even put an offering on the house then? You're like, are you mad? Because we got the house for 20 grand less than the valuation. I'll sniff an old man's piss all day for 20K. Are you insane? I'd have him back to do a shit in the kitchen. <laughs> What's he doing? He's taking another 10 grand off. That's what he's doing, love. <laughs> so we had the keys for the, the rental place. This is our first house, first time we bought. We had the keys for our rental house and we had the keys for our new home. For about three weeks, we had both of that overlap. A lot of the time in, in uh, buying houses, people have that overlap and then do renovations in those three weeks. We did no renovations. We cleaned. <laughs> but Laura cleaned. And that's not me going, I don't clean, the little lady cleans. I wasn't allowed to clean. She sort of vetoed it. She was like, bless you, you'll try, but I need to do this to my very high standard. You're not going to be able to do it how I need it done. She was like, could you deal with the garden? You deal with outside, I'll deal with the house. And it's a weird one, because I've never really done any gardening before, got no equipment, but there's a weird thing that sort of, just a weird thing that sort of pops into you, like a, it's a manly response, like, yeah, don't worry about it, babe. I am outdoorsy. Like... Have you got any gardening equipment? No, I'll stream it with my dick. Don't worry about that. I'm a man. I can deal with gardens. Uh, don't worry, love. You do the house. I'll do the garden. I've got it. I went outside. I was like, oh, I've made a mistake. <laughs> it's like fucking Jumanji out the back. It was so overgrown. The hedge on both sides was ridiculously overgrown. And I knew my limits. I was like, I can't do this. I need a real man. So I went from like, yeah, no worries, babe, to like, I need to find, find a man on the internet. I went on a website called Bark.com that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> Don't think it's a real website. I think it might have been a trap that I walked into. It's the only website I've ever used where you have to put all your contact details in first, all your contact details before they even let you look at the website. Like, that's legit. That sounds right, doesn't it? Like, I knew nothing about online security. I was like, mm, all right, my name's Daniel. I live here. And this is my telephone number. <laughs> Fucking idiot. So I've been on the website for all of like four minutes. I've been, I'm on the second profile. I've hardly been on it. And I get a phone call from an unrecognized number. Like, why did I even answer it? Why, who answers them? Oh, look, a surprise. <laughs> I'm going to tell this story honestly. Don't paint me in a great light. I'm just going to, I'm going to tell it honestly. A phone rang and I went, hello? And this guy went, hello there, Mr. Nightingale. <laughs> now, I've seen your profile on the website on your bar.com. And I was wondering if you could come round and give your quote on the garden. <laughs> All the plus ones like, what's happening? Is this allowed? I don't know if this is allowed. Someone said to me, that's a terrible Irish accent you're doing there, Dan. Not trying to do an Irish accent, am I? I'm trying to do this guy's accent. And it was mental, and I'm not far off. Come round and give you a quote on the garden. And I'm not proud of what happened in me. My reaction, my gut reaction in my heart and in my mind was very much, whoop, whoop, gypsy alert. That's how that went down. <laughs> not good, though, that is it. That's definitely prejudice. That's bigotry. That's first 
ballot Hall of Fame bigotry. Here in Acton, you know they're from a community, you make a negative judgment, and that's not me. And I was sort of gutted with my own reaction. I felt guilty. I felt appalled with my own sort of gut, like whoop, whoop. So I sort of went the other way. I kind of overcorrected. I went from whoop, whoop to liberal fanny really quick. I went from whoop, whoop, gypsy alert to like, we are the world. I was like, come on, Dan, you're better than that. I didn't do that out loud, by the way. That was all in my head. I didn't say out loud, whoop, whoop, come on, Dan, be better than that. This is the internal monologue of a knobhead. I was like, be better than that. And I was like, yes, mate, I'd, lo I'd love you to come round to do a quote. He got to us in about 25 minutes. I would describe the travel time as suspiciously quick. He turned up in a banged out Mondeo. He left two pretty moody looking fuckers in the car. I think they were back up. I think he brought back up to a gardening quote. And then he got out, small guy, older, very nice, very friendly, big smile, part magical. You couldn't help but like him. He was like, hello there, Mr. Nightingale. And he got a welcome like he's never got in his whole career. Because of how bad I felt from the whoop whoop and because of the overcorrection, I was like, yes, hello, welcome to my home. I found myself doing a really big sort of over the top, like, this man is welcome in my home to show my neighbors how accepting I am. We are the world. I, I went so big, I could see the little flash in his eyes, like, oh, fuck, he's mental. <laughs> like he wanted to look back at them on there, like, it's going to be a big quote, this one, boys. <laughs> he's got a learning difficulty. This is going to be a big quote. <laughs> going to make some good money today, boys. We're getting a new Mondeo. <laughs> a 2003 with all four wheels. He came around the back of the house and he did one of the most theatrical quotes you've ever seen. I'm not saying he did acting training, this guy, but he was a bit of a natural thespian. He's like, oh, look at this, Mr. Nightingale. Oh, it's a big job, Mr. Nightingale, a big job. Looking at the garden, he was like, it's a two-day job with a three-man team. Big job, and I have to get all of this out of here, get it all out of here, and then trim all the way down there, and trim all the way down there. It's a big job, Mr. Nightingale, but don't worry, I've got a good team. I've got a book, <laughs> he said this, he said this as part of a gardening quote in the year 2019. This century, he went, I've got a good team of strong boys. <laughs> and then he went, and I've got this one boy, he's a big strong boy, works in the forest. <laughs> and then he stopped talking. <laughs> because I felt guilty about the whoop whoop, I was like, that's amazing. Forests are so good and logs are heavy. It's a great upper body workout. What I should have done is gone, what the fuck are you on about? What year is it? What forest, the forest of Mordor? Is he Orakai? What on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Stood there nodding like a twat, like, yeah, amazing. Forest. Stood there nodding for so long, he started adding to the quote. He was looking around like, oh, would you like the guttering cleaned out, Mr. Nightingale? Would you like the gutters cleaned out? I was like, I would, yeah, we are the world. And then in a, in a career first, I think he ran out of things to add to the quote. That was my favorite bit of the whole day, that weird pause where you could see him looking around going, fuck, this has never happened before. I can't see anything to add to the quote. If I'd have stood there any longer, he'd have started looking at me for things to add to the quote. And if you put a few pounds on there, Mr. Nightingale, would you like to go on a weight loss plan? We'll put together a fucking great weight loss plan for you, Mr. Nightingale. We'll get you exercising. I got a big strong boy. He works in the forest. He'll fucking chase you around the forest. He'll get his big lad out. Fucking specimen of a... You'll fucking run then, Mr. Nightingale. And what's under that hat? Are you a baldy? I fucking knew you were a baldy, Mr. Nightingale. We'll grow you a beautiful afro. Would you like that? I got a big strong boy. He grows afros in the forest. I wish I'd put that on a merch mug. That would have been so much better on a merch mug, wouldn't it? I got to the end of the fucking tour and realized how good would that be on a mug. I got a big strong boy, grows afros in the forest. <laughs> Just watching people try and explain that in the work kitchen on Monday morning, like, what's that? Um, oh, the long story. <laughs> Do you know what a forever home is? <laughs> in the end, I knew I, I, I had to ask for a price. And I'm not, I'm not good at that. I get cringed out by it. Can't do haggling. And I knew it was going to go wrong. He went, he went, okay. I was like, how much, mate? He was like, oh, how much? For cash? Uh, I don't know. I don't think we could do it for any less than 8.50. And then that was the end of that, really, wasn't it? Because I'm married. 
And if you're married, you know full well. You can't give 850 quid to a guy to do a job your wife expects you to do for absolutely fuck all. <laughs> so I sort of laughed at how absurdly expensive that was. I was like, <laughs> and it must have freaked him out. Because that's the first time I've not nodded like a bell end. I spent the whole court going, yes, amazing, Forrest the Great. He's put a price on it. I've gone, eh. <laughs> he was like, okay, we could go to 550. I was like, I wasn't laugh haggling. That wasn't me trying to get the brows down by laughing at you. Like, <laughs> okay, you're mental. We'll do it for £17.50 and a bag of quavers. He's fucking mental, boys. We agreed 550, and then overnight I shat it, bottled out, and just started ignoring my phone. Pathetic. What a wimpy way of dealing with it. And you know, the saddest thing is, three years later, I'm gutted I didn't pay him the money. Because what I realise now is, I missed out on meeting the big strong boy that works in the forest. <laughs> that would have been worth 850 quid the next morning. Dun, dun, dun. Here to the garden! Garden! Tree! Tree bad! <laughs> <laughs> Got it. That's the end of the gardening bit of the show, by the way. If you're younger and you're in the room, like, is it all about gardening? It could have been, because I'm 41, and I love talking about my fucking garden. And I know there's older people in here over 40 going, keep going, down, keep going. What else have you built? A pergola? Fucking hell, a garden office. Ugh. Have you had it valued? What was your favourite bit of the show? You did a bit about right move. What's the, what's the demographic of the room? I'm fascinated by this. Under 25, give me a cheer. Got some younger people, okay. In and around 30, give me a cheer. Nice one, a little bit older, all right, cool. Over 40s, give me a cheer. There you go. Look at the smart, all at the back. That's experience. I'm not sitting at the fucking front. Not my first rodeo. Do you feel old, over 40s? Yes, thank you for being fucking honest. I do feel old. And I think you can tell a lot about where, there's certain things in life that tell you where you are in the journey in terms of how old you are. Getting ID'd for alcohol is a massive giveaway. As how you react to it says so much about how old you are. If you're under 25, you get ID'd for alcohol. It's not a compliment. That's how you know you're young. You're just like, oh shit, you've forgotten your ID. Well, nice one, dickhead. We're not going to get in now, you fucking idiot. That's how you know you're young. When you're older, in and around 30, if you're lucky enough to get ID'd, it's the best thing ever, isn't it? That's when you're, you get ID'd, you're like, oh my God, are you ID'ing me? I'm 30. Thank you so much. <laughs> I try and hydrate. Thank you. It's amazing. <laughs> Everyone turns into a lush when you get ID'd at 30. Thank you so much. No, I don't need to get in the nightclub. Fuck Claire's birthday. I'll float home. La la la. <laughs> and I thought that compliment would last into your 40s. It fucking doesn't. This is totally true. Last year, I got ID'd buying super glue in B&Q. <laughs> and it doesn't feel like a compliment. It just makes you question the mental health of the person working at B&Q. I nearly went, mate, are you on the glue I'm trying to buy? <laughs> she took it so seriously, she was like, oh, I'm sorry, love. This is super glue. <laughs> We've got a policy. Should, I'm gonna need to see, see some ID. I nearly went, you're fucking not though, are you? Look at the state of me. I honestly nearly said, I'm dickhead, I'm wearing cargo shorts. Work it out. I drove here in a Volvo. I nearly showed her the fob to prove my age. Like, Volvo. Also, we're in a B and Q. That's all the ID you need. No one under the age of 18's ever looked at a retail park fucking B and Q. I obviously said none of that, I just looked annoyed, but I looked annoyed for long enough that she panicked and went, all right, you can just have it. <laughs> the temptation to then get that super glue out of the packet and huff it right in front of her like, <laughs> should have ID'd me. <laughs> Y'all don't know me. <laughs> it's the same old thing. <laughs> Got ID'd at 30, that was great. Only happened once, when you're a baldy. Doesn't happen more often. When you're bald, so many things have to go right for you to get ID'd. It was great. I was buying gin in Manchester. We were drinking at a mate's flat. They just had cans in. And I was going through a gin phase. And I needed to buy a gin and tonic. I go through weird, short-lived, very obsessive, addictive phases in my life. And this was a gin thing. 
in my life, I've gone through some pretty weird, debilitating, short-term, obsessive sort of periods. Yes, yeah, some more. <laughs> some more destructive than others. <laughs> <laughs> Tiramisu was bad. That got out of hand. That was a rough six months. Cost me about two and a half stone. Sainsbury's stopped being a shop and became a dealer at one point. <laughs> Fuck me, Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's Tiramisu is good. Sainsbury's Tiramisu is shit hot. And it's not even expensive. I'm not talking about a brand one. Sainsbury's own tiramisu. Not, not, not the individual parts that's meant for fucking tourists. I'm talking the professional dinner party ready vat serve six eaten by one greedy con. <laughs> Tray of tiramisu. And I always ate five portions and left one. Like I was a gentleman. Like I couldn't possibly finish it. <laughs> You're not even meant to get halfway, mate. That got so bad at one point I had a spoon in the glove compartment of the car. <laughs> Just in case I fancied tiramisu on my travels. And I've done loads of cocaine as well, but it's not as funny as tiramisu, is it? <laughs> tiramisu is a bit more light-hearted, isn't it? Can't lose your family to tiramisu addiction. <laughs> Put the pudding down, Brian. <laughs> I was going through a gin thing. I was like, lads, I'll be 20 minutes. I'm just going to go and get my gin, and I'll be back. Went to a Tesco Metro right in the middle of Manchester. It was a nice day that day, beautiful day. Manchester gets about 10 of these a year. This was one of them. Walked in, it's just me and the grumpy staff. They're all working in Tesco on a nice day. They're fuming. Got some fresh lime, some slimline tonic. Went round to the counter, because it's a moody city centre Tesco metro. The good booze is behind the counter. You've got to ask for it. There was a woman serving that day who I will remember for the rest of my life. She was so fucking grumpy. It was some of the worst customer service I've ever received, and it just made me respect her. She was sat down, clearly not meant to be, on a stool. She gave zero shits. Quite a large lady. She was beautiful. Had a very thick Jamaican accent because I think she was Jamaican. <laughs> Just in case you were imagining like a large, beautiful white lady in your head and then you're like, this story doesn't make sense anymore, Dan. She wasn't just a beautiful white woman doing accents to pass the fucking shift. I hate working at Tesco, but I love doing a Jamaican accent. With the supervisor, like, please, Stacey, stop doing the voice now. We've told you three times in writing it's racist. Cease and desist, please, love. Go fuck yourself, Leanne, you dirty bitch. I hate you. I hate working at Tesco. But I love doing a Jamaican accent. Now, what you want, white boy? <laughs> Just, she was Jamaican. Or of Jamaican descent. I don't know. Let's not get in the weeds. I was in such a good mood, I was like, can I get a bottle of Gordon's gin, please? This is honestly how she ID'd me. She went, no. <laughs> she went, no. No, I'm afraid I'm going to need to see some age verification. <laughs> Which is how you know this is a true story, because I can't make that shit up, can I? You have to have been ID'd Caribbean style to know it even sounds like age verification. <laughs> It took me a while to work out. I was like, age verify? Verify? What are you verifying? Verify my age. Why are you verifying? Oh my God, you're ID me. I'm 30. You're ID me. Thank you. It's fucking ace. I was like, mate, that has made my week. I, I'm 30. I've been ID'd since the late 90s. Nice one. But I don't have any ID. There's no point checking. I know I've not got any. I'm a fucking grown up. But I definitely want the gin. So as much as I appreciate the idea, I'd still like to buy the gin, so I don't know what we're going to do. But because I'd obviously taken it as a compliment, I think it knocked her confidence on the whole idea in me thing. She was like, well, okay, but at the very least, I'm going to need you to take your sunglasses off. <laughs> and I'd done that thing, you know, on a nice day when you forget to take your sunnies off inside. I was like, oh, you must think I'm so rude, I'll take them off. I didn't even get them off properly. I got them down to here. Me and this woman made eye contact over the top of my sunglasses for all of 0.3 fucking seconds, and with a frightening speed and certainty, she went, okay, I can serve you. <laughs> I nearly went, what did you just see in my eyes? I got ID'd with my eyeballs. What did you just see in my eyes that changed your mind that quick? Thank God I didn't ask in case you went, years of self-neglect and broken dreams. <laughs> now take your gin, you sad little man. <laughs> your guan need it. <laughs> Walking back to my mates for absolutely crestfallen, going, why are you IDing me though? I was buying gin and tonic and fresh lime. That's not a, that's not a street underage drinker 
Fucking, there's no 16 year olds in Manchester going, let's get fucking wasted tonight, yeah? Dazza, you look older, yeah? You'll get served. What are we drinking though? Well, remember, Dazza, last night it was Pim's o'clock, wasn't it? So tonight I fancy a little bit of jizzle and tizzle, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, Dazza, remember though, fresh lime, yeah? Because we've already got the knives to cut it. And go slim line tonic, yeah? Because man don't drink no calorie. <laughs> got a slimming world meeting on Wednesday, Dazza. Sin it, bro. That's one for the dieters. <laughs> That's a little reference for the dieters. A little bit of a slimming world reference for the dieters. I feel your pain. I'm going to be back on the wagon real soon. This is getting out of hand. Thanks for that. You don't have to put your hands up. I know the tiramisu bit was difficult. <laughs> I need to get back on it. This is, this is getting out of hand. I've really struggled to lose the baby weight. Because <laughs> it was a 40-hour labour and the only places open were a vending machine and a WH Smith. So for nearly two days, through the labour, I survived off frazzles and full-fat Red Bull. And I've had insulin tits ever since. <laughs> and I'm aware there'll be mums in the room going, I'm sorry, are you asking for sympathy for a difficult labour because of frazzles in our bed? I get it. Any mums in? Oh, that was said, was that you? It was said with no joy. Any mums in? Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. How are you, all right? Have you got little ones or big ones? That did sound nonsense. That sounded nonsense. With my reputation. Little ones or big ones? Not interested about the big ones. How are young? <laughs> How old? Teens, oh, you're well out of the game. Anyone with little ones? Again, sorry for sounding like a predator. I got little, you got little ones? Yeah? Boy, boy or girl? Two girls. Two girls. Have, we got any, have we got any dads of boys in? Yeah? Can I ask you a question, gentlemen? When your son was born, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> this is borderline intrusive. Was he, born, was he born with weirdly big testicles? Yes! yes thank you, madam! <laughs> Isn't it weird? Yes. Did you know about it? No! Right, this is a PSA. This is a PSA for all the lads in the room who maybe one day are going to have a son. You need to know this shit. Baby boys are sometimes born with weirdly large testicles that they grow into. And no one fucking tells you about it. Afterwards, Laura was like, I knew. When, when were we told? Admittedly, it wasn't in the pregnancy classes. That's mainly about breathing. It'd be a weird pregnancy class. He's like, ladies, this is how you breathe. Breathe like this. Gentlemen, the nads are going to be fucking massive. Get ready for it. You need to know that these testicles are going to be weirdly large because if you don't, you're going to ruin the birth of your son like I nearly did. <laughs> Just obsessing about it. That birth was a long one. Laura did fucking amazing. What was funny about it was she went into it very earth mother because it's second time round. Our daughter, Etta, five, six years old at this point. That time it was C-section, obviously epidural. Laura's high as a kite. This time, she was like, I just don't want to do any form of painkillers. Definitely don't want to do C-section. I just want to do it a lot more naturally this time. She went, I'm not even sure I want to use gas and air. I was like, cool, babe, no worries. 25 minutes into that 40-hour labor, she was huffing on that thing like we're at the after party, mate. She was doing the best Bane impression I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> you think frazzles are your ally? Didn't want to do gas and air. Bullshit. When the diamorphine got offered a few hours later, she was on it like Pete Doherty. <laughs> and by the way, if you don't know what diamorphine is, just a little insight, it's just a professional medical way of saying fucking heroin. Because <laughs> the NHS can't be like, do you want some smack? You having a bat? You having a twat of a birth? Do you want some smack, love? We'll get you some smack. Two seconds. Can we get some skag in room five? <laughs> Should have an absolute bastard. Let's get some skag for room five. You're right, babe. What are you listening to for, for birth music? Whale song. Fuck that. Let's get some prodigy on. <laughs> Smack my bitch up. That's our sense of humor. We're a bit edgy on this ward. <laughs> now, I'm not saying do heroin. But what I will testify to is it fucking works. Diamorphine's some good shit. Because Laura was in a lot of pain before she had it. She was like, oh my God, it hurts. Oh, stop eating frazzles, you fat twat. Oh. Literally 40 minutes later, like, 
I feel good. I feel good. Do you feel good? Mm, I feel feel really good. Is your head warm? My head's warm. Mm. My mouth is dry. I love you so much, babe. And then she went, I'm not even sure I'm in labour anymore. I was like, I think you might be. It had to be an emergency C-section because it was going on too long. People were like, oh, God, I feel bad for Laura. She didn't know what the fuck was going on. She was just like, golden brown, texture like sun. And then we got in there. I wasn't the birthing partner for my daughter. This is my first rodeo. This is the first time I've done this. And I thought, because it was my son, um, there was going to be a curtain up. I'm sensible enough to know you don't, you're not at the business end. I was up with Laura and I thought it was going to be a sort of bit of a theatre, like almost a theatrical, as the baby came out. I honestly thought my son was going to be born and it was going to be like Lion King. <laughs> like from behind the curtain, like... <laughs> It really wasn't. There was a lot of yanking. And then the purple slimy alien comes out. And everyone's like, oh, isn't he beautiful? And I was like, look at the size of his balls. The fuck? Whose kid's this? I basically accused Laura of cheating on me. You're like, what the fuck? You've been shagging a silverback gorilla. Has he got your eyes? He's not got my fucking testicles, I'll tell you that. I love him. I love him. And he's getting a little bit older now. But God, babies ruin stuff. You have to love them. God, they ruin shit. We went on holiday earlier in the year. It was horrible. Why did we take a baby abroad? You're just taking your suicidal knobhead of a toddler to a more expensive, more dangerous place. (laughs) The worst hotel room imaginable. What are Spanish hotels thinking when they design their family hotel rooms? What is the room? What What should we make it out of? Is it a family room? Yes. And we should make it out of marble. Yes. Marble. The hardest of all the things. And what about the sharp corners in the room? Marble. Yes. Sharp marble corners. Families love sharp marble corners. Ten days of watching my toddler just fucking wobble towards each one of them. Sock it first. I was like, I'm going to have an anxiety attack. We need to get the baby out of the hotel room. Can't do the swimming pool. I was like, I love the beach on holiday. I was like, babe, let's get the baby on the beach. He's going to be safe. Can't fall and bang his head. As long as you keep him away from the water, be sound. Laura knows loads more about parenting than me. She's much better at it than me. She was like, babe, you can't take a one-year-old on the beach because he'll just eat sand. So that's how that'll go. And I never do this, but I was like, babe, I'm going to override you on that. I just think it's instinctive eating sand. You'll do it once. You'll learn very quickly. You know it's horrible. You don't do it again. It's an instinct thing. (laughs) Fuck, he didn't get it. It was, honestly, on the eighth mouthful, you're like worrying about his long-term future. Like, is he going to be all right? Long term. And he's looking at you like, what the fuck? And you're like, yeah, horrible, isn't it, mate? Ah, ah. <laughs> Trying to find the positives. Like, at least we don't have to pay for uni because he's not getting in, is he? <laughs> he had so much sand. He had sand in his nappy the next day. I think he shat sand. <laughs> not the only one-year-old in history to exfoliate his own arsehole. <laughs> Which you definitely can't put on a mug. <laughs> Having Etta abroad was great. She saved the holiday. She had a great time. Also, it's the first time we've taken our child to Spain. She's called Etta. I don't know if you know the history of Spanish terrorism. <laughs> this is totally true. There is a Basque separatist movement, a Spanish terrorist organization, who've killed people, by the way, and they are called, I shit you not, Etta. <laughs> As a result of which, no Spanish children are ever christened Etta. Like, no kids in the UK are christened the real IRA. And I hadn't realized this until Etta ran off in a shop. I called back. I was like, Etta! And the look of fear in that Spanish shopkeeper's eyes, he's like, oh my God. Oh my God, hide behind the shop. This is why we make our shops out of marble. Safe, safe marble shops. Because of the kids, we still sleep in separate rooms. 
I've been using that for an excuse for ages. But actually, we sleep in separate rooms, me and Laura, because it's well better. I fucking love it. Any couples in the room, will, will you admit that things are good, but you sleep in separate rooms? Yeah. Oh, good. Good on you. Is your partner here tonight? Oh, good, you're here. It's always awkward when you're like, yeah, we sleep separate. Is she here? No. Good. Who's the snorer? Her. Yes. Because everyone thinks it's me that's the snorer. It's Laura. And by the way, my wife is the most beautiful person I've ever been anywhere near. But she sleeps like a dying walrus. And she's so weirdly fucking warm. When the clocks have gone forward, I can't share a bed with her. I can't get anywhere near her. You could dry pottery near a midriff. She's like, spoon me. I'm like, I can't get anywhere near you, Chernobyl crotch. Not a fucking chance. I can feel the radiation coming off you. I'll lose teeth. Whom, whom, whom. And then the snoring. <laughs> Kicks. I'm in the spare room. It's not spare. It's never spare. I'm in it. It's my room. I decorated it. It's got all my stuff in it. It's my room. And I'm this close to getting an Iron Man duvet cover and just completing the man-child dream. I've just regressed to the status of teenage boy, like, night-night. Mm, it's fucking great. <laughs> and the only reason I've not got an Iron Man duvet cover is because when you sleep separately, you can't just roll over and make love. You've got to agree the bonk. You've got to be like, come on, babe, we should have a bonk tonight. She's like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's got to happen by about 5 p.m. There's a weird, with my wife, there's a weird cut-off point where you've got to agree the bonk before, like, 5 p.m. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. It's like transfer deadline day. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get your papers in. But when you're sleeping in separate rooms, you've got to agree the venue like an FA Cup semi. And I don't want to lose the home fixture. I don't want every bunk to be in a way leg because if you've got an Iron Man duvet cover, your wife is not fucking you in your bed. No grown woman shags her husband with an Iron Man duvet cover on. No 36-year-old woman gets frisky like, Mama like that, Mama like that. Ooh, Avengers Assemble. Like, I get it. I get it. One of the problems with sleeping in my own room, I am watching too much pornography. I've nearly completed Pornhub. It's an issue. <laughs> Bad. Part of the problem is, Laura's not bothered. Some partner's like, no, I don't like you watching that stuff. She couldn't give a shit. She's an enabler. I, not that we've ever had big chats about how much porn I'm watching, but I can tell she's fine with it, because if after bedtime, we've got in our separate rooms, and she needs to speak to me in person, God forbid, it can't be dealt with with a WhatsApp voice note. If she actually needs to speak to me in person, she never just fucking rushes in. What are you doing? Because she knows what I'm doing. She's such a legend about it. She gives me so much warning, and she's crossing the landing. She bangs her feet a little bit. She's not heavy-footed. She's just a good egg. She clears her throat. <coughs> she's got no symptoms, no allergies. She's just a ledge. And then when she knocks on the door, it's not a quick, like, what are you doing? It's a very definite, like, black rod open in Parliament, like... <coughs> and then she pauses. God, I love her. By then, I've got a kimono on. I've got encyclopedias out. Smoking a pipe. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, darling. I act surprised. I wasn't expecting you. No, you're not interrupting anything. Merely learning hour. Yes, it is good to moisturize. And you know why she's sound, I think, is because she watches porn, which is something I found out early on in our relationship. Again, I know some lads. I've got some mates who are like, are you all right with that? I don't care. I, I absolutely don't care. I'm fine with her watching porn. I just never want to know what specific genre of porn she's into because I think if I find out, it's going to hurt my feelings. Because <laughs> I very much doubt she's into short, tubby, white guy porn. <laughs> I don't think she gets an afternoon to herself, whips out a laptop, and then watches some knobhead like me at five foot seven and three quarters, bad eyesight, regular breathing difficulties, struggle through a scene. <laughs> The only porn you've ever seen when an inhaler whips out, like... <laughs> I don't blame her. I do, however, know her type, her physical type. And if you're in a couple and you're like, we're each other's type, grow the fuck up. 
I've worked it out. I didn't ask, I just worked it out. She likes Vikings. <laughs> Not full on Viking. She doesn't need a proper Viking. She doesn't go to battle reenactment like, mm, getting frisky. Shield wall! Ooh, like, <laughs> she just likes that look. You know, whenever there's a celebrity, she thinks hot. It's always the same, got like a goatee. There's a dad on the school drop-off. Good looking fucker. I call him Viking dad. He's got a top knot. I hate him. <laughs> Little Nordic beard, tattoos. I call him Viking dad. And I saw Laura looking at him. And I was joking. I was like, ooh, you fancy Viking dad. And she was like, no, I don't. I was like, oh my God, you actually do? <laughs> ah! And it clicked. I was like, that's your type, Viking. So sad. Do you know the saddest thing is about working out that your partner of nearly 10 years is into Vikings? It's the 90 seconds afterwards where you try and convince yourself that you're a bit Viking as well. <laughs> I was like, well, I know the history of the British Isles. <laughs> and I've got fair skin and pale blue eyes. <gasps> maybe I'm a bit Viking. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm descended from a Viking. And then you look at yourself at five foot seven and three quarters, bad eyesight, regular breathing difficulties and things. If I'm descending from a Viking, it wasn't first wave battle Viking, was it? <laughs> at best, I'm descending from like third wave accounts and stock checking Viking. <laughs> My Viking ancestor was the guy who was like, have you signed for that shield? <laughs> I've got a job to do here, big lad. <laughs> Fuck, it didn't work. Damn! It didn't work on the special record and it's staying in because I fucking love that joke. It has worked one in every three tour shows, but I'm so stubborn about that joke. I know it doesn't make sense. Someone actually Instagram DM me and went, uh, you do realise there's no such thing as a third wave accounts and stock checking Viking. I know! I just think it's funny. I just think it's funny imagery that my Viking ancestor was at the back of the longboat going, I just look after the equipment really. You know, I come along for the trip, you know, and I join into a point, but I just leave it at, at a pillage. <laughs> I went on about the Viking thing so much that I mentioned it in front of my mother-in-law, Jude. I love my mother-in-law, Jude the dude. She's so fun. She's so sound. We have a laugh. I thought, this will be fun. I mentioned Laura's Viking thing. And we'll have a laugh at Laura's expense. It backfired horribly. I was like, Jude, do you know your daughter's into Vikings? And she was like, mm, I know what she means. I was like, nice one. That's not how I wanted that to go. Because now in my head, Laura's from a long line of women, generation after generation, going, yeah, Vikings. I honestly think if you go far enough back in my wife's ancestry, you'll get back to like an Anglo-Saxon village 1,100 years ago off the coast of North England. One fateful afternoon, that terrible sound from the North Sea. <laughs> And the whole village is like, oh no, oh my God, Vikings, run, flee. My wife's great, 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 great grandma's like, you go, save yourselves. I'll hold them up. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> she wall. You've been fun, ladies and gents. Let's see how long I've done. Wow, that's gone really nicely. Thanks very much for coming down. How good is it being in a church? I <laughs> love it. Just being a knobhead, swearing in a church. <laughs> Woo! Can I get an hallelujah? And I just want to know, the person who left a little bit of coke on the top of the disabled toilet because you've been racking up, you need to get yourself right with God, boy. I want to talk about something at the end of the show that happened last year, mentioning Coke. Uh, and everyone that listens to the pod when I talked about it in the pod was incredibly supportive, and I appreciate all that support. Last year, for the first time in my life, I've been going out clubbing back 20 years ago and getting on it, getting wrecked. I like a drink, but I also like to get on it from time to time. But I've always been in control of that. And then last year, coming out of the lockdown, my second child had been born, I built a garden office, which was meant for work. I turned it into a crack den real quick. And I started doing cocaine on my own. Secretly, really destructive behavior. It just started at once a week, and then it was a, a weird build towards doing it like twice a week. And I tried to stop, and I couldn't stop. And I scared the shit out of myself. I was really low. I started using the word addict for the first time. And uh, I admitted it to Laura, and we got help in seeing a therapist, dealt with it. 
Uh, I beat tiramisu. I've beaten cocaine as well. Thank you for your support, guys. Now. No, hang on. I feel like you're getting too rara. I'll still do coke. I just don't do it on my own in a garden office at the back of my garden like a fucking idiot. I talked about it on the pod because I needed to. I talk about it in the show because I've got jokes about it. I had to do it on the pod because when, uh, when you're dealing with addiction, there's a thing called roadblocks that you need to put in place. If, you, if you've got a problem with gambling, you can't go to a casino, obviously, or hang out with the guys who love gambling. It's the same with booze. You've got to put roadblocks to stop the thing that fucks you up getting to you. I had to do one of those roadblocks on the podcast because I've talked about doing coke for all of the time that Have A Word has been popular and people at live shows kept giving me cocaine as a thank you. <laughs> and I think you can guess which cities that was happening in. <laughs> all I'm going to say is it wasn't Shrewsbury on a Tuesday, was it? <laughs> Fucking lads, I love your part. Here's a little pretty. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people have asked what happened, like... Did you go on any mad benders? I was like, no, it was really sad. I just got coke delivered and did it on my own and then did admin or watch the NFL really intensely. <laughs> One night, everyone went to bed dead early. It was a really nice summer's evening. I got two grams dropped off and fucking cleaned the garage. <laughs> and this is how I know I've got a problem with cocaine. I'd do it again. <laughs> it was quality. I don't know if you've ever cleaned a garage off your tits. It's amazing. You're just like, yes, I love cleaning garages. <laughs> Hoover in it. With a Hoover. <laughs> but I couldn't stop. And I'd lost control of it. And I scared myself. I was like, holy shit, this is out of, this is out of hand. I need, I need to sort this out. I deleted the dealer's number. Classic move. Right, I've quit. Delete the dealer's number. And then about 48 hours later, I'm in my call log trying to find the unrecognised number. <laughs> like a little coke squirrel. <laughs> Horrible. I was at the my lowest ebb, like my self-esteem through the floor, felt like shit, felt like I was letting myself down, letting everyone down. I was like, right, I need to deal with this. I need to admit it to Laura. People say that with addiction, the hardest thing is admitting it to yourself. I disagree. I think the hardest thing is admitting it to your partner or your loved ones. Because I think really, you know you're a knobhead. You've got to let them down. So the next day I sobered up, I just felt like shite. And Laura's in a really good mood. And I was like, right, cool. I'm going to ruin that. <laughs> I was like, can I speak to you about something? She was like, of course, yeah. I was like, right, listen, this is really important. I need to speak to you about something. And it's something I'm pretty ashamed of. And I'm going to need your help with it. And because of how important it was, I sort of paused to find the right words, which I definitely shouldn't have done. Because in the gap, she went, is it your weight? Fucking okay, hell. I don't know if you've ever felt like you're at your lowest step and then you're like, oh no, new low. You're addicted to coke. You're fat and addicted to coke. And afterwards, she made a valid point. She was like, it was a bit confusing because who puts on weight while they're addicted to cocaine? You're like, that is a valid question. The only dickhead in the country doing full fat coke. That is an absolutely valid point. So she was very supportive. She was brilliant. But she was firm. She was like, you need to seek professional help because if you fuck this up, I'll make a difficult decision if I have to. So I was like, right, cool. She was like, seek professional help. So I went and found a counsellor who specialises in addiction, did some therapy. I've loved it. There should be no more stigma about counselling and therapy. It's amazing. Phenomenal reaction in the room there, guys. That was so quintessentially northern, it actually hurt. I've been doing some counselling, there should be no stigma. Oh, I didn't realise Dan was gay. <laughs> <laughs> counselling. That's not how we deal with that, Dan. We're British, we're working class. You don't get a therapist. You take the anger, you take the pain, you push it all the way down, all the way down, and then you die of an aneurysm at 53. <laughs> Quality reaction. Mate, if you're teaching on the edge of giving therapy a try, you should absolutely try it. It's awesome. You're talking to someone who's excellent at talking, and, and it's all about you. They're not allowed to tell you any of their bullshit. If you love talking about yourself, you'll love therapy. You just get to be like, me, 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 and then also me, and then me, but then also me, and then they go, oh my God, that's fascinating. And have you ever considered that you, 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 but also you, and you go, oh my God, yeah. Me! It's great. I love it. I love talking to him. Do you know what the saddest thing was on session number five? I was like, oh, fuck. 
You'd have been great to do coke with. Damn. I lost a soldier. We could have cleaned garages together. Here's something scary. I've never paid for healthcare before. Basically, Laura went, if you fuck this up, you could lose your kids. I was like, I'm on it. Went online and just found the cheapest therapist I could. That's a pretty stark warning, isn't it? Fuck it up, you'll lose your kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 70 quid for talking. I can find that cheaper. <laughs> Horrific. Mine's 35 quid an hour, which is weirdly cheap. I honestly don't know if he's got a degree. He could be a sand eater. I've never checked. I'm just stingy. And if that's not an advert for why the NHS needs to be free at the point of entry forever, we need to protect the NHS and make sure it's always free. I love the NHS. And this is not... This is not a post-COVID sort of like bandwagon thing. I love the NHS. The fact that it's free, it's so important. It needs to be protected because the alternative is going to be so grim. In it, in this country, particularly in the north of England, paying for healthcare, watching your dad have a heart attack. Like, you having a heart attack, dad? No, not during peak hours, I'm fucking not. <laughs> dad, we need an ambulance. Never mind that, get on Groupon first. <laughs> Print out a voucher. <laughs> Horrific. Do you know when I fell in love with the NHS? When Etta was born, when my first child was born. You realise how amazing the NHS is. You go in, we went in, we're scared, we're vulnerable, Laura's angry. You go, in, <laughs> you go in and you basically give the person you love most in the world to the NHS. And then four days later, they give you two people back for free. <laughs> how amazing is that? You know why it's amazing? Because there's an alternative. It's America, where they have to pay for their health care. Someone told me that childbirth starts, the process of child, that four days, starts at $25,000. Yeah, there's a beautiful silence in the room. What? That's ridiculous, isn't it? Imagine getting booked in for your induction. You're about to be parents. You're dead excited. And then they slide over an invoice for $25,000. you would be like, what the fuck? I'll get this cheaper online. I'll go on Bark.com and really make a saving. Okay, I'll get the boys back around. Hello there, Mrs. Nightingale. Oh, we're going to do a beautiful job at the childbirth. I, I think it's a two-day job with a three-man team. We're going to get all of the baby out of here, all of the baby out of there, and then trim all the way down there, and trim all the way down there. But don't worry, i got a big, strong boy. Works in the forest. He'll pull the fucker out. So God bless the NHS. And thanks for your support. Uh, and thanks for coming down tonight. You've been an absolute peach of an audience. I've loved it. I hope you've enjoyed it too. My name's Dan Nightingale. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you.